Hey guys, it's Dr. Childs. Uh, today I want to talk about iodine and I want to talk about um, specifically iodine in the setting of using it for Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism and really to determine um, if you're getting enough iodine and really how much do you need. And so to illustrate this concept, I will, I've taken some excerpts from some clinical studies. So all of this information we're going to be talking about is um, is um, in from is a uh, taken from these studies and you can find the links to these to the relevant studies on my website here if you're interested in taking a look but um, so what what this uh, first image that you're looking at um, is is it's a it basically goes over the top well several um, institutions that that have given guidelines in terms of how much iodine is recommended so you know like there's a you probably have seen before that there's a recommended amount of vitamin b12 of vitamin d etc of all these things so this exists also for iodine as well um, so you can see here that the Institute of Medicine recommends a certain amount, the WHO recommends a certain amount, and then the Endocrine Society recommends a certain amount for pregnant and lactating women, but not for um, non-pregnant lactating adolescents. So the way you want to look at this is you want to say, okay, so basically if you're you know, a non-pregnant, non-lactating person, um, and you're just basically an adult, let's just put it this way, this, this column would be better left to just say adults who aren't pregnant or lactating, okay? Um, basically, these, the mo majority of societies agree that you need something like 150 micrograms of iodine per day. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is if you go to pregnant women, you go to lactating women, the demand is higher. And we'll talk about the reason for that demand being higher in just a minute here. But you can see that the for normal adults and adolescents, 150 micrograms is the recommend, recommended amount. And for pregnant women, that jumps up, you know, even almost as, as much as double if you're lactating. So 150 times two would be 300 and they're recommending about 290. So we're kind of getting up to maybe one and a half to two times the range of a, of a non-pregnant person. Like that, that's just kind of the way you, you can think about it. Now, again, these are not exact amounts because you have to understand that when you're trying to extrapolate information and apply it to the general public, um, it doesn't really work that well. It's kind of like you kind of have to say, well, let's let's come up with guidelines that are sufficient for 90% of the population because we don't really want to give people who don't need too much too much and we don't really want to give, you know, we don't want to really fall into that trap. So this is, let's cover 90% of the people with these recommendations and just kind of worry about the 10% later. So that that's the logic behind using these from a statistical standpoint, okay? Um, that's using standard deviations and a number of other things. The reason is because each person's unique, a little bit different. You know, let's say I, <clears throat> I may need 150 micrograms of, of iodine and you only may need 140 right that that's based off of the amount of iodine or based off the amount of thyroid that you're producing based off of your age based off of your metabolism a number of other factors so what we try to do is just say generally speaking how much should most people get right that's what this that's what this um, image is trying to say well but here's the interesting story um, so another study which this is this only goes up to 2008 just so you know so you can you can find um, you can try and find more uh, more recent studies saying how much, on average, we we intake in the United States, but this is this is data dating back to 2008. So it's it's recent, but not not within the last couple of years here. Um, but you can look here and see the amount, the average amount of iodine that was being consumed by people based off of the year. Okay, and th this is again for the United States. So um, and this is specifically um, women of childbearing age, by the way. Though th this is what that this data is referring to. So you can see here back in from 1971 to 1974, pregnant women were consuming about 294 micrograms on average, right? So the 88 to 94 is 128, dropped 2001 to 2002, 132 micrograms, right? 2003 to 2004, 139, and then 2005, 2008, 130. Now, what's interesting here is you can look at all of this, this intake here and say, okay, so, so, um, pregnant, pregnant women or women of childbearing age were consuming this amount, so let's take the most recent, from 2005 to 2008, these women were consuming 130 micrograms, and yet the recommended the recommended amount was 150. So you can see here, I mean, even if you're you know not great at math, um, the, the, this is not as high as this, right? So it's, it's 20 micrograms on average per day less. Okay, so that's really interesting because automatically, right off the bat, we have two studies saying, hey, you should take in at least this amount. And yet we have data to show, well, people aren't really getting that much amount, you know, th that amount that we were, we were describing. So already there's some discrepancy there. So automatically, just from a statistical standpoint, looking at the data, you can say that there's probably a slight deficiency. Now, is that deficiency enough in, the, in, a, in a, enough people to cause problems? Well, that's another question. But just looking at the data and saying, are, are you getting enough? Maybe, may, pr probably not. So the general, the general kind of standpoint here when you look at the data is that it's one that suggests a lot of people, in fact, even the more healthier people, probably are getting less than they need, especially if they're not using iodinated salt. 
So that's that's kind of an interesting story. Now let's go up to another set of information and talk about why would you have iodine deficiency? Because hypothyroid hypothyroidism um, is uh, or, or one of the cause potential causes I should say not one of, yeah it is one of the causes of hypothyroidism is a lack of iodine. Why? Well, because iodine if you if you think of T3 and T4 you know those are the 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 thyroid hormones. The reason it's called T3 is because there's three iodine moieties on that um, thyroid molecule okay and that that the amount of iodine that is present on the thyroid mo molecule and where it's at determines if it's going to be active and what its function is going to be so you can say you can kind of just see automatically that if there isn't enough iodine in your body there will not you you may have insufficient um, creation of thyroid hormone so that's why this is really important so let's talk about iodine deficiency disorders and again this is taken from another clinical study so we have two reasons for people having low iodine okay or or iodine deficiency disorders let's put it that way meaning you have symptoms of having low iodine the first is you're not taking in enough okay and we just showed you in that last set of studies the amount that's recommended and the amount that we're actually taking in and there is a deficiency there by 20 micrograms per day on average right so we already know that's the case but let's talk about why so first of all there, you need to have adequate iodine levels in the soil of, of whatever food is, you know, so that it can be absorbed into the food and then you can consume the food and you get it that way, right? So you have to, if the soil is depleted of that nutrient, then of iodine, then you're going to have less amounts in your food. So you may say, well, you know, whatever. I have a list of, I have a list of foods um, down here. We'll just go to that real quick. And you can, that way you can see this. Hold on one second. So we'll talk about the food here foods high in iodine so you can look here and see kelp bread milk um, fish fillet and iodinized salt um, and then some vitamins and some other things so if you say you know kelp obviously having the most 16 um, to 8 oh, oh I see it's, it's a range here so 16 to 8,000 potentially obviously there's a lot right that, that was the point I was trying to make so you have no idea if the kelp you're eating has 16 or if it has 2000 right because that depends on a number of factors and the same thing is true with other with other foods or or fish specifically because if this fish didn't eat as much as the other fish or you know ate in a place that was slightly less depleted that's going to change the amount that you're getting so that's not a great way of measuring how much you're actually going to get based off of the food that you consume okay but let's come back up here and we'll talk about another big one here and so we already know that if you're not consuming enough you're going to have low amounts yeah we know that the second the second side or the second side to that coin is you may inadequately use the iodine that you're taking in okay so let's say and this this is actually where things get really interesting because you might you might be consuming an iodinized salt um, or you might be consuming you know uh, fish and you might be consuming um, seaweed etc you might be consuming enough of it however the utilization of the iodine once it's absorbed is another story and also the absorption is another story so just because you're taking in enough doesn't mean it's actually number one getting into your body or number two getting into your thyroid so they can produce or your other cells by the way so that it can produce the thyroid hormone that it needs to and that's really interesting so why why would that be now there's a lot of reasons for this and um, we're just piggybacking off of that original study that we talked about but, but let's go over the most common reasons why you actually uh, might be more deficient than you realize in in iodine either because you're not utilizing it um, or you're not consuming enough so first of all one of the most common reasons for having these iodine deficiency disorders and having um, meaning that your thyroid function the the lack of iodine in your diet or in your body is contributing to your hypothyroidism would be you know many of these things on this list so first of all is the inadequate intake of sea vegetables or iodinated salt and so yeah this kind of go this is kind of obvious like you know if you just look at how how much um, seafood we're eating in the United States? It's it's pretty low compared to say somebody who lives on like you know um, a, a coastal area or somebody in Japan or something like that, right? Like we, you, that that shouldn't be hard to wrap your head around. Yeah, that one's pretty straightforward. Um, and and obviously the pr the primary source of iodine in our diet is from these sources, so that can be a big deal. Um, the second thing is has to do with the demand and the turnover of iodine once it's in your body. So what do I mean by that? So if you have had multiple pregnancies or you're currently pregnant or you're currently lactating, these conditions cause you to potent potentially deplete the amount of iodine that is stored within your body. So your thyroid stores, you know, X amount of iodine and your and your cells have X amount of iodine. And so you do kind of build up a store, much like iron. You know, you have you have the amount of iodine that's kind of readily available in the body, and then you have some for backup just for a rainy day because it's so important. However, you can kind of like let's let's say in the state of lactation or pregnancy you might be drawing from that store that that storage amount that's in your body or in your thyroid more than you than you more than uh, or, or or you don't yeah you're just drawing from that store 
to the point where it's depleting the amount that you have in, in uh, your reservoir. Okay, and, and pregnancy does that because the, the, during fetal development, the thyroid in the fetus is rapidly turning over thyroid hormone. Okay, so that's where this can occur. So if you've had multiple pregnancies or you're currently lactating and the, let's say you're consuming 130 micrograms of iodine per day, but your demand is 290, well, that deficit is going to come out of that storage, that form that's in your body. And so slowly over time, you'll deplete that store. And that may not be right away. That may not be your first pregnancy or it may not be your first lactation, but it may be along the way. That's why this can kind of develop in a slow and kind of sinister way. So basically what this is, is talking about is increased turnover or an increased use. Um, the, uh, obviously, this goes along with the second one, which is the um, recent history or current history of breastfeeding or lactation. Same concept. It increases the demand. Um, so another one would be nutrient deficiency. So basically, what we're talking about here is selenium deficiency and or iron deficiency. So both of these nutrient deficiencies make iodine deficiency worse. Um, and I talk about this um, a little bit. We won't, we won't go into detail here. Um, but basically, this these nutrient deficiencies can kind of team up together to to make hypothyroid symptoms hypothyroidism symptoms worse okay and so specifically iron but iron is required for the production of of um, thyroid hormone inside of the gland itself so if you have low iron your the enzyme that creates thyroid hormone is going to be somewhat suppressed and then also if you have low iodine then that's further going to be depressed right so you can see there's kind of a synergistic mechanism between the two um, so that's kind of the, the, how that works uh, and then Here's another kind of important one that I don't think gets touched on as a lot, and this has more to do with the utilization of iodine. So let's say you're consuming enough iodine, you are, let's say, let's assume that you are absorbing it, um, and then, but let, let's say that there's some blockage because you're, you're having exposure to endocrine dis disrupting chemicals such as bromide, chlorine, and fluoride. And so what these things do is they can concentrate inside of your thyroid gland, and because they have, if you remember to going back to the periodic table, these, um, these elements are on the far right, okay? And so basically what, what that means is it changes their chemical structure so that they look similar to iodine. All right, and what that means is the the way that your body kind of looks at looks at chemicals and and things or, or um, elements is that it wants to displace things based off of the amount of charge that they have. So if something looks similar, it may be a little heavier or maybe a little lighter, but it looks similar in terms of its charge. It can displace other things. Okay, and so that's that's a problem because if it, number one concentrates there because of again based off of charge, and number two is displacing the active iodine, then you might be, you might develop a thyroid hormone that is in, in inactivation compared to what it should be based off of the amount that's um, concentrated of, of these other chemicals that's concentrated in your thyroid gland. Okay, so that results in um, a bunch of issues. It may result in low circulating, it may re reduce conversion peripherally, it may reduce uh, the production of thyroid hormone in the gland itself. This whole concept is not really well understood yet. However, we do know that it plays a role. In fact, the, the Endocrine Society came out with a study kind of demonstrating um, why this is. And so it looks like it seems to be the case that the TSH is unaffected if you have high levels of endocrine disruptors. Um, the T4 seems to be relatively preserved. However, the total, the total T3 and the free and circulating T3 levels are always lower in these patients. Okay, so that's that's another one. Um, another one would be exposure or overconsumption of goitrogenic compounds or foods. This is um, people like to focus a lot on this, but you have to eat inordinate amounts of these. Um, these foods to have any sort of issue. So I include this here for completeness, but I don't think it's absolutely necessary uh, to consider in most cases. I don't think it actually plays a role in um, physiologically in most cases. Maybe a little bit, but we're talking a couple percentage here or there, so, so not a big deal. Um, the next one is high estrogen levels. The reason for this is estrogen inhibits iodine absorption, um, while testosterone increases iodine absorption. So, and this is really interesting. So again, this comes back to the point where you might be consuming a lot of these foods, like let's say you're consuming seaweed, you're consuming um, iodinated salt, etc. You're consuming them. However, if you have high estrogen levels, you know something like PCOS or some sort of estrogen dominance um, syndrome, then the the absorption of that is going to be reduced. So you might think you're getting adequate amounts, when in reality the absorption is reduced and therefore the utilization is, is reduced as well. So with the combination of all of these all of these things can seriously impact your body's ability to um, use iodine correctly and may lead to worsening of symptoms and so i'm not suggesting that this is even the most common cause of hypothyroidism necessarily however what i am suggesting is that this the the iodine status in your body is likely playing a more significant role than you are realizing and therefore many patients may stand to benefit with the, by supplementing with a you know a small amount of iodine so that's why i bring all this up um, I will go over in future videos um, how to continue to determine this, but I really just wanted to talk about how much iodine do you need and what causes iodine deficiency. If you have any questions surrounding this, because um, it is somewhat of a controversial topic, you know, please leave them below and I'll get back to your questions as soon as I can. But otherwise, I hope you guys found this helpful.